Back in 2020, I got extremely into a game called Hades that had come out that year. It quickly became one of my favorite games of all time, and to this day, I'll sometimes just boot it up and do a few runs if I need something to play and can't quite decide on something new. So when Hades 2 got announced, I was, well, extremely excited to say the least. But since the game won't be out for a while, I decided it may be fun to go back and check out the other games by the studio behind Hades, Supergiant Games. Which is why today, we're playing Bastion for the first time now. It's kind of funny, actually. I've heard about Bastion for years, and I've had it in my Steam library for forever, but I never really put together that was made by the same people that made Hades, until I actually pulled up a list of all the games they've worked on. To give a brief history of the studio, Supergiant was started in 2009 when co-founders Amir Rao and Gavin Simon got extremely invested in indie games that were coming out around the time, such as Plants vs. Zombies, World of Goo, Braid, Castle Crashers, you get the gist. The pair already had a fair amount of experience making games, with their most recent jobs in the industry both being working on the Command & Conquer series at the time. And with some encouragement from Rao's father, the pair left their jobs and founded Supergiant Games in his Room. From here, the duo would recruit several other people they knew from within the industry to form their new studio. The first game was going to be Bastion, which actually spawned from the studio's art director, Gen Z, drawing the Bastion itself, and this blew Rao and Simon away. They both asked her to leave her job at the time and come to be their art director, which she accepted and she still is the art director there to this day. I could spend time going over the entire development teams as they all have similar stories to this, but basically the entire studio was just a whole group of people who are extremely passionate about games and making their dreams come true. Which which, you know, led to the studio being where it is today. So with all that being said, I'm excited to check out Bastion finally after all this time. Like I said earlier, it's a game I got forever ago via Humble Bundle and never actually got around to playing. I'm sure we've all been there. Steam sales and free games and such tend to just pile up now and then. Anyway, I'm happy to finally get around to trying out this beloved game. Let's see what I think of it. As always, there's going to be spoilers, so if you want to go into this game spoiler-free, I'd recommend pausing the video here. Otherwise, sit down and get comfy. I'm Jay, and let's talk about Bastion. The story of Bastion starts with our player character, the Kid, waking up on a floating rock in the sky as he traverses a crumbling world left floating in a void while a mysterious narrator begins talking about the events that led to the Kid being where he is. The world was destroyed due to an event dubbed the Calamity. The Calamity essentially fractured the city of Kaelandia as well as the continent around it and threw what remained into this void. The Kid survives making his way through these crumbling ruins and ends up at the Bastion where he meets our narrator, who we learn is named Rux. Rux tells the kid to collect cores that remain in the ruins from before the Calamity in order to power up the Bastion, and enable it to undo the Calamity. The more cores the kid gathers, the more like it's rebuilt on the Bastion, and the further out it's able to send the kid to look for more cores. The kid eventually finds a survivor in the ruins named Zulf, who he brings back to the Bastion. Zulf is a member of the Ura race of people. They used to be at war with the Kelandians long ago. He gets along well enough with Rox and is mostly just happy to be safe at the Bastion. This changes, however, when the kid brings back another survivor he finds, this time a girl named Zia. She's an Ural like Zulf, but she was raised in Kaelandia since she was a child. With her, she has her father's journal, which Zulf reads while the kid is away. From this, he learns what really caused the Calamity. Basically, the Kaelandian military was trying to completely wipe out the Ura, and they employed an Ura scientist, Zia's father Ven, to work on their machine to do it. Ven purposely sabotaged the machine, however, and made sure that it would take the Kaelandians with it. Finding out that the Kaelandians have tried to genocide his people and Rux, who knew about this, had withheld it from him, he understandably gets pissed and damages the Bastion before disappearing. The kid then goes out to get shards of cores to repair the Bastion and continue to build it up while Rux gives more backstory towards what happened with the Calamity. While the kid is gone, however, Zulf returns, leading a band of surviving Ura with him. They damage the Bastion once again and take Zia with them this time. The kid fights his way through Ura territory to get her back, and when he finally gets to her, he finds out that she had gone with the Ura willingly. She did this in order to see their intentions and compare what they were hoping to achieve against what Rux had told her about the Bastion being able to undo the Calamity. With Zia safely back at the Bastion now, the kid makes one final trek out to get the last shard he needed to give the Bastion enough power to stop the Calamity. This shard also just so happens to be in the heart of the remaining Ura territory. The kid fights his way through the Ura stronghold and finds them kicking the crap out of Zolf, who the Ura blamed for leading the kid directly to them. The kid is then given the choice of saving Zolf or leaving him to succumb to his wounds. If the kid leaves Zolf behind, he wipes out the remaining Ura and goes home with the shard. If he saves Zolf, however, the Ura will attack him but cease fire once they realize the kid is just trying to save someone else and watch as the two of them hit the skyway back to the Bastion. I personally saved Zolf, and I'll get into why in a bit. Once back at the Bastion, the kid hands over the final shard and is given a choice. Rewind time to before the Calamity but no one will remember it, or use the Bastion's power to escape the Calamity Zone and start over again somewhere else. I personally chose to escape to find a place to start over, and I'll get into why with that in a bit as well. 
I have generally positive feelings in the story, but I'm still kind of mixed on it. I think the presentation of it, with almost everything being relayed solely through Rux telling the story of what's happened to Zia being a really cool framing device that helps make this feel really unique in how it's played with throughout the game. The way Rux, Zulf, and Zia are written is also really well done in my opinion, with each one having understandable motives and reactions to the information they learn throughout the game. Mostly, anyway. The story starts to slip a bit towards the end of the game when Rux just says some stuff about the era that feels a little uncomfortable given the fact that his country tried to genocide their entire race. Like, I can understand him being a bit hesitant to reveal to an Ura person he just met that the reason for all of this was the people trying to wipe out their people. But him talking about the Ura towards the end just feels like he's a bit more internalized racism that he needs to work through than it was originally it was let on. It's kind of fascinating because by the end of the game, you can very easily see that he's just an unreliable narrator. And while it's interesting to watch that kind of breakdown of him and how he has a character is still flawed and has his issues, I do think something does take away from his claims that the Bastion will fix everything by going back in time when we get some of his used like this. To me, it kind of just screamed of returning to the good old days and not thinking about what the consequences of those were. A solid example of this is the encounter with Zulf after the other Ur have beat him up, where Rux is positive he knows exactly how it's going and how it's all going to be fine that the kid is slaying the Ur because they're going to be fine once the world resets. Meanwhile, the kid is watching Zulf get beat up by his people and he has to choose to leave him to die or not. Like I said earlier, I chose to save Zulf. I did this because in my personal opinion, Zulf wasn't a bad guy. I think if I found out the guy I met a few hours ago that was claiming his magic machine could fix everything was also within the government that tried to nuke your entire culture and ended up nuking themselves in the process, I'd... well, I'd be pretty distrustful of him also. <laughs> I think the game does a good job of not pinning Zulf as the bad guy despite him being the antagonist for a good bit of the game as well. It really shows that they understood what they wanted to do with him character-wise, and it's one of the stronger parts of the narrative in my opinion. It's really interesting to compare and contrast how the game handles him and Rux by the end. As time goes on and the kid gets exposed to more and more things, the perspective on them flips, and even if I'm a little conflicted on Rux ending up as the racist grandpa, I do like this dichotomy they set up. But what I'm ultimately really conflicted about how it was handled is the ending of the game, more specifically that final choice I mentioned. This is mainly due to me feeling like a moral choice like this in a game shouldn't have a clearly better outcome. What I mean by this is that if you choose to return to the world before the calamity happened, nothing actually ends up changing. This is hinted at more explicitly once you hit New Game Plus, but just in terms of the context of this choice scene, you can already see where this is going. The machine will return the entire world before the calamity was set off, but no one will remember what happened. No one will know what the calamity did and what it will do to everyone if it's let loose. And without a way to warn people or for anyone to know what will happen, the people who tried to genocide the Ura will just go ahead and do it again, leading everything back to this exact set of circumstances and cause the cycle to play out once again. I mean, with the leave ending, you may not be momentarily saving the lives of those lost in the Calamity, but you are able to ensure that nothing like that can ever happen again going forward. So if you think about it for a few seconds, you realize that by going back, you're not stopping the genocide of the Ura. You're just setting it up to play out the exact same way all over again once time gets reset. The cycle of violence is a key part of the game's narrative, and I think the idea the team behind Bastion were trying to get at with this choice is that the cycle isn't going to end unless we make it end. If you go back in time prevent the Calamity from happening with the Bastion, you're resetting things to zero. No one learns anything, the people in power who pushed for the Ur genocide that blew up in their face are still going to do that and it's going to harm everyone all over again because there's repeating history without change. But if you leave it behind, start over with the knowledge of what went wrong and how that violence hurts everyone, you can prevent something like that from happening again. Focusing on going back to a better time before bad things happen without learning about what led to them aren't going to make the atrocities not happen. Happen. It just means they're going to happen again. I think with this, the team at Supergiant were trying to provide commentary on learning from history and being destined to repeat if we don't. I think this is further exemplified in how Rux is the one trying to push for us to go back in time before the Calamity and just let things function as they do. He knows the full history of what happened with the Calamity and why the world ended up the way that it did, but he doesn't want to learn from it and really acknowledge why it happened. He just wants to undo it all and forget it, which in turn just leads to it happening again and again and again. You know, I think saying this out loud and talking about this has actually made me change my stance on the ending. When I actually have all my thoughts fully down like this, I think looking at this choice as something that doesn't work on a gameplay level isn't the right way to think about it. Because yeah, sure, on a game level, it's weird to make one choice just outright better than the other when it's supposed to be a moral thing, but I think this choice just shows it's important to take a step back and realize that sometimes in order to tell a narrative in an interactive medium, sometimes doing something against what usually works may end up standing out for the better. I think the message about breaking the cycle is really strong now that I've thought about it a bit more, and I honestly really like how it's handled 
on this game. I think overall the story of this game is pretty good. There's a few very noticeable bumps and a few things that haven't aged super well in my opinion, but I think for a first outing and writing a game it was a pretty solid story. It's interesting comparing the writing of this game to Hades, since it's really clear that as time has gone on the writers over at Supergiant have really honed their skills. It's interesting coming back to this and seeing how there are elements of their first game that are still present in their most recent one writing wise. Hades also has similar gameplay to Bastion as well, though I think the transition backwards from Hades to Bastion in that sense is a lot more jarring than it was with the writing. Bastion is played from an isometric view where the kid moves along paths of floating remains from the world before the calamity. Here he fights various different enemies while using different weapons to reach the cores he has to collect. You get to choose two different weapons to bring with you that change how you can approach different encounters. I mainly stuck to the spear and the pistols once I unlocked them since they felt the most interesting to use to me personally. Your mileage may vary if you end up playing the game though. You can also use specific and special attacks from these weapons that work off of charges you can pick up throughout the level in the form of these little dark potions that enemies drop. Generally, levels are just you running through these remnants of the world, solving simple puzzles and killing anything that attacks you in order to reach the core slash shard you need to get. Once you do get the item you're there for, there's a chance that the world may start to crumble and you have to race your way through the level as it falls apart behind you, which does add a nice bit of variety to a normal loop, but they don't happen half the time so it kind of lures you into a false sense of safety sometimes before dropping another one of these on you. This helps keep these sections from overstaying their welcome, but it also feels like the levels that don't have these suffer a fair bit from just kind of ending. While you're in the levels, you can also find different items that can be used to upgrade your weapons back at the Bastion, which gives them new abilities. Early on, you also unlock potions to improve your abilities in the fields from here. Conversely, you can pray to different gods of the shrine in the Bastion in order to make your battles tougher and challenge yourself a bit. I think this system is kind of neat and reminds me of the heat system from Hades, but in a bit more of a rudimentary state. To do all this, you generally need different currencies and items that you get from the normal levels, but you can also do weapon challenges to get extra materials. These are generally pretty straightforward and just require to use your weapons creatively. There, Alright, nothing spectacular, but they're neat little distractions. Speaking of little distractions, there are also little memory battles you can do that are basically just a horde mode with backstories of characters attached. I wasn't super big on these due to the actual gameplay loop not being particularly engaging to me, but I went through them to get the story tied to them, and I enjoyed that portion of them at least. This section's a little short this time around, but I really don't have a ton to say about the gameplay loop of Bastion just because, like... Pretty basic, I felt like. You use your two attacks, you dodge sometimes, you use your special on bigger guys. Being a bit unfair to the game breaking it down like that, but it's genuinely hard for me to remember more about it than that, and I played the game a few days before writing this. I think in terms of how it does its enemy AI and the way weapons work, it didn't really grab me because they felt like prototypes of how I've seen this same style done elsewhere. I know that's not entirely fair, and it's probably just because of the fact that this game is sort of a blueprint for the one I'm thinking of directly, but we'll talk about that later. Overall, I just didn't really click with the gameplay and felt pretty bored by it. It's not explicitly bad or anything, it's just kind of there, and that's the most I can say about it. I think Bastion's OST is probably my favorite part of the game in all honesty. The music manages to be hunting in a way that meshes with the world's crumbling aesthetic extremely well. I would sometimes find myself just stopping and listening to the tracks while they played in some areas, and I normally don't do that with games. I definitely recommend checking out this soundtrack on your own time if you get the chance. It has some really striking music that I enjoy listening to even outside of the context of the game. Several of the tracks such as Spike in a Rail and Pale Watchers have actually entered my work playlist since while I was writing this script and making this video. Those songs were the ones that for some reason made it easy to focus on what I was doing the most. Definitely give them a listen if you get the chance. Something that I couldn't really shake in my entire playthrough of Bastion was just... well... How much I'd rather be playing Hades than it. The games have a lot in common in terms of gameplay in my opinion, with Hades feeling so much more refined, expanded, and just more enjoyable to play overall. The same can be said about the writing as well, with the writing in Hades feeling much tighter and better at getting its themes across in my opinion. The reason I bring this up specifically is because it kind of circles back to the mentality I've been trying to cultivate within myself for a bit. Recently when I've been trying to get into a new series made by the same creative team, I've been trying to start from the beginning. My reasoning behind this is that generally if I start from the beginning, I can see the series and the creative team evolve and refine over time, which in turn helps me understand the series as a whole better and see the whole range of the series I'm trying to experience as it was originally released. While I'm playing all the Armored Core games, starting from the first one in order to play 6 despite none of the numbered Armored Core games being connected in a really important way. 
To me, I feel like I can appreciate the older titles more if I go in without expectations of what the games that followed them achieved. So in the case of Bastion, having played a later game by Supergiant that has a similar perspective and gameplay loop, kind of felt hard for me to get into since Bastion is a lot rougher than Hades is in my opinion. And while I do think this hampered my enjoyment of it, I also don't really think this is the game's fault. People naturally get better at things as time goes on, so it makes sense that the same studio would learn how to refine and be better at making things after several attempts. They also have the benefit of being able to look back at their older projects and see what worked and what didn't. So with that, there's no surprise that Hades is a more refined game, since it seems to have built off the framework of Bastion a fair bit. In a perfect world, Bastion being the basis for how their latest game works shouldn't negatively impact Bastion, but human brains are kinda dumb, mine especially. So I can't help but like the gameplay loop of Bastion less than I feel like I would have if I had played it before playing Hades, due to it doing a lot of what Bastion did mechanically just better. And I can't help but feel a little annoyed at myself for thinking like this, because if I had played Bastion first, I probably wouldn't have had this ending though the video be dedicated to this. And honestly, I probably shouldn't even have this here, just because it's kind of you know, me just being stupid, but it is just like a weird mentality I have and I kind of wanted to talk about it and I figured this was the best chance to bring it up. Regardless, because of this, I think I'm going to keep trying to play things in release order, just to try to have as much of an unbiased opinion as possible when I go through things from now on. I think even if older stuff in a franchise isn't great by the standards of the genre today, for example if you played Dragon Quest 1 today and compared to modern turn-based RPGs, it's still worth going back and checking them out to see how these genres got their start and what led to this some series becoming what they are today. Now I know there's no possible way for anyone to be truly unbiased about anything, but I think for me personally starting from the beginning of the series or the beginning of a catalog for a smaller studio is probably going to be the way that I myself get the best experience playing through something going forward. But at the same time, I want to make it clear I'm not saying that everyone should have to always start every series from the beginning or play through a developer's entire catalog from start to finish to play their new game. That would just be ridiculous and way more time consuming that a lot of things are really worth. If you have a way that works for you and how you experience media, then I say keep at it. I just know that for me, I'm going to keep trying this approach. Even if I have to watch, say, every Gundam series to watch Iron Blood, Orphans, and Witcher Mercury, I wouldn't do it because I want to get the full scope of things. With Bastion, I wish I had gotten the chance to play it without anything shaping some of my opinions beforehand. The game is still extremely charming, and I think that for a first attempt, Supergiant did really well with this game. I just also know that I'm not the biggest fan of it because I've seen something similar from the same team do the same style of gameplay in a way that I just enjoyed a lot more. That brings us to the tier list. I think I'd probably put Bastion in C tier, right above Devil May Cry. At its worst, the game was just kinda alright. It's probably not something I'm going to play again anytime soon, but I think it's not outwardly bad or anything like I said earlier. Man, looking at it now on this list, it feels weird to put it here when out of everything new I've played for the series so far, it was by far the thing I've heard the most praise for before going into it. I guess it just kind of goes to show that your tastes aren't always going to line up with the common consensus on things. I will say it's interesting that we haven't had an actual bad game yet in this series. Whether that's a statement on how I approach media or how good the stuff I've been playing is, I'll leave for you all to decide. And with that, that's all I really have to say about Bastion. Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Jay Talks About Games. I'm going to try to continue to upload new episodes of this every other Friday, so stay tuned for that if you like this episode. Beyond that, there's a few more things that should be going up here on Disc for my friends and I, which I'll have links to on screen and in the description down below. Be sure to check those out if you enjoyed this, since everything else we're working on is pretty great as well in my opinion. Otherwise, if you like this video, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, since that's the only way for YouTube's algorithm to know the smaller channels like ours. Regardless, I've been Jay, and thank you for listening to me talk all day. See you all next time!